heartbreak tonight for two families who lost sons at the hands of law enforcement in this state and today did not feel like justice was served. The final sentencing for the death of Elijah McLean in just a moment. We begin in Clear Creek County, where a jury couldn't reach a verdict on whether Christian Glass's killing was a murder. Our Steve Staker has covered this from the sheriff's office's misleading initial statement about what happened to the body camera video that showed the truth to today's verdict that found former Deputy Andrew Buin guilty but not on the most serious charge, Steve, second-degree murder. Yeah, Kyle, they found him guilty of reckless endangerment. It is a class two misdemeanor, carries up to six months in jail and a $750 fine as the punishment in that case. The jury again hung on those two key counts in the case, second degree murder and official misconduct. They could not reach a verdict about whether Andrew Buin was guilty of that or not. Andrew Buin on his way out of court today, we asked him if he had anything to say. He said not at this time. He, of course, it, it was indicted on second degree murder for that shooting in June of 2022 when Christian Glass got his SUV stuck on a rock, called 911 for help. And that's when police showed up, tried to negotiate with him for an hour to get out of the car. Andrew Buin made the decision to break his window, to tase him, uh, to shoot him with beanbag rounds, and then to eventually shoot him five times in the chest. Now, the jury obviously was very invested in this case. Uh, they took a lot of notes. They asked a lot of questions of all the witnesses on the stand. They were emotional when they could not reach a verdict, and it was something that Christian's mother, Sally, noticed on their way out of the courtroom. Some of the jury members looked straight at me, and um, a couple of the female jury members, they had tears in their eyes. And I don't know, maybe sorry that, that you know, a verdict wasn't reached, or sorry that we lost our son, mm. or, you know, I, I don't know. But it was, um, it was very, very sweet and very kind. So where does this case go from here? Well, those two counts are still open, meaning prosecution could decide to retry Andrew Buin on second degree murder and on official misconduct. Uh, the DA, Heidi McCollum, would not say whether or not they will do that. Obviously, they'll be back in court again next week. Unclear if they'll have that decision by then, but they'll talk about the sentencing terms for that one count of reckless endangerment, Kyle. Uh, a lot to decide moving forward. It's already been a long journey for the Glass family from here or from the beginning when they had no idea what happened to their son, to finding that video, to the indictment, to a lot of delays in this case, and yet one more delay in trying to figure out if they'll get justice in this case or not. Now, prosecutors have to decide if they want to go back and try to find a second impartial jury in a small, tight-knit community that not only knows about the killing, but has now seen all the coverage of this first trial. Yes, 1,500 summonses went out to people in Clear Creek County. That is one in six people here got a jury summons to try to be on this jury. It's going to be incredibly difficult to find another jury in this case. I talked to a Clear Creek County commissioner who was in the original jury pool. That tells you how small this is. Just so many people uh, who got a summons in this case. It'll be interesting to see if they're able to find another jury to try to try those two remaining counts. One in six is a wild number. Steve Steger, thank you. To Aurora now, and the final sentencing for the last of the three first responders who were convicted for the death of Elijah McLean. Former paramedic Jeremy Cooper was sentenced this afternoon to a 14-month work release program and four years probation. He could have gotten up to three years in prison for criminally negligent homicide. He is the one who actually injected Elijah McLean with the fa failed dose of the sedative ketamine. That evening, police had stopped and wrestled McLean to the ground. He was just walking home, didn't do anything wrong. Cooper addressed his statement in court directly to Elijah McLean. That led Elijah McLean's mother, Shanine, to walk out. There's so much I want to say to you. First, I want you to know how sorry I am that I couldn't save you. How beyond and forever devastated I am that I didn't get to hear your last words. You cannot evoke my son's name to absolve you of your own sinful nature. You betray yourself and your attempts to disrespect me here today, like Jeremy Cooper's disrespectful lawyer. It all shows your culture will not change because you find no fault in your actions. McLean has been there for every sentencing for every man involved in her son's death. Paramedic Peter Chichuniak got five years. Former police officer Randy Redima, 14 months. 
Shanine McLean told us today she had no expectations coming into this final sentencing. When you sit here and think about how the laws are in Colorado compared to the laws in other states, Colorado is very lenient on their own employees when it comes to their own crimes. So I wasn't expecting much at all. Nothing at all. I guess that's why I'm happy still. Two other police officers, Jason Rosenblatt and Nathan Woodyard, were acquitted of charges for Elijah McLean's death, which did lead to policing reforms in Aurora and across our state. Police in Denver at this moment are preparing to forcibly break up an encampment of pro-Palestinian protesters on the Auraria campus. It's happening for the second time today. Give you a live look at what's going on out there at the quad outside the Tivoli building. You've got a group of pro-Palestinian protesters who set up an encampment last night, got cleared by police today. Immediately, those who weren't arrested set up the encampment again. There you see the folks in the riot gear ready to move in for a second time. The warnings were given about 35, 40 minutes ago. The warnings that police give for legal reasons about we're going to move in. You can move this way. You can move that way. But if you stay, we may encounter you with force. Those warnings have been out there for a while. Protesters aren't budging, so we're going to keep an eye on things. About 40 protesters were arrested earlier today on trespassing charges. Students and community activists set up this solidarity encampment yesterday. Their demands are that CU Denver leadership condemn Israel's war with Hamas, that CU divests from corporations operating in Israel, and that CU terminates contracts with companies tied to the U.S. military. Campus leaders say that that encampment grew to more than 100 people today and ignored calls to leave. They said it was campus police who made the decision to move in using force this afternoon. There are Jewish community groups calling for that protest camp to be shut down. They say that it poses a safety concern for Jewish students at Auraria. A group of far-left state legislators and Denver City Council members just put out a call within the hour asking police to stand down, saying that tents on campus don't justify what they call the escalation of violent arrests. As we said, the protesters came right back after the first police sweep. Our plan is to keep out here as long as we can. We were in front of the police at the level that uh, they set for us. We are not violent. We have no compliance with being violent. Uh, we're peaceful. This is a peaceful protest that we have going on. Um, and uh, if the police choose to respond in a violent way, we will uh, uh, we will uh, respond uh, with the best interests of our demands and uh, the uh, encampment in mind. We have seen what that kind of language means other places around the country as this echoes college campus protests across America, students, faculty, community members standing in solidarity with Palestinians. More than 100 protesters were arrested at Columbia in New York City this week. Today, the University of Southern California announced that it will cancel its main graduation ceremony. It's citing security concerns and safety measures around protests and arrests there. There were mass arrests on the University of Texas campus in Austin yesterday. But late this afternoon, the Statesman newspaper in Austin says every one of those trespassing charges got tossed out. We're going to keep an eye on what's going on at Auraria, and if police move in, we'll take a look. RTD employees reported nearly 70 percent more on-the-job injuries last year, and exposure to drug smoke was cited hundreds of times. RTD workers can now get paid leave if they need time to recover from exposure. Our Kelly Rinke takes a closer look at RTD's well-known drug problem. Across the country, we've heard about assaults on transit workers, but something in the air is also concerning RTD employees. The long-term effects of it, exposure are very concerning. Union President Lance Longenbaum says his members are worried about being exposed to drug smoke on their buses and trains. But it's also one of the things that's affecting RTD's retention. The problem impacted operators so much, last year RTD agreed to place employees on paid administrative leave if they feel impaired. Uh, it gives an operator the, uh, the, the completion, uh, paid completion of the shift that they're relieved from and the following day to recover from the effects. RTD says employees reported an exposure to drug smoke more than 350 times last year meaning it paid more than $60,000 to operators to take administrative leave. They're not making the decision about whether they should not operate their vehicle 
based on pay. They're, ba they're making that decision based on how they feel. Those feelings are shared by transit workers hundreds of miles away. The transit agencies reached out to the University of Washington. Dr. Marissa Baker and other researchers at the University of Washington collected samples from buses and trains on the West Coast. We consistently found methamphetamine in the air and on surfaces. Um, even at and near the operator. Whether detectable um, amounts of drugs has long-term health impacts on operators is a question they didn't answer. There haven't been studies that have looked at kind of the long-term impact of exposure to secondhand drug um, in a workplace environment. An answer Denver workers couldn't wait for. It's a safety matter. Now, if an operator wants to seek medical care, they submit a workers' comp claim. RTD would then pay for that exam. The district paid more than $45,000 last year in workers' comp for these reports. All right, Kelly, thank you. Thanks. As kids in Colorado who have been abused or neglected try to rebuild their lives, there are dedicated volunteers who walk alongside them. They're with CASA, court-appointed special advocates, people who will spend years helping just one child through the court system, foster care, and beyond. This week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is supporting CASA volunteers in their work in 46 counties across Colorado. Their statewide nonprofit will distribute our donations fee-free for their local chapter's most pressing individual needs. So in Jefferson County, it's this housing program for kids who age out of foster care. In northern Colorado, they need help recruiting male volunteers and Spanish-speaking volunteers. Arapahoe County could use support for its Safe Baby Courts, a program that helps mothers with substance abuse issues. And out on the Western Slope, their volunteers need help with basic expenses because they're often driving hours one way to see their kids and to go to court appointments. And down in the San Luis Valley, they're just creating their first CASA program. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get that link to donate. You've proven even $5 helps, and you've piled up a bunch since Wednesday, more than $13,000 in donations. And on top of that, all of the monthly giving to the Word of Thanks Fund. It means that we are starting this micro-giving campaign with almost another $20,000 in donations on top of what you've raised in a couple of days. It's incredible stuff. You can use that same QR code or text to get there. Democrats are doing property tax reform at the last minute for another year at the Capitol, and today their ideas ran into reality. And no matter what challenges make the nightly news, we will end the week here on Next with a word about what is most encouraging and most joyful in the lives of our neighbors. If solving property tax relief in Colorado was easy, then we wouldn't be talking about it year after year. Democrats at the Capitol wouldn't be waiting for the last moment of legislative session to roll out their ideas year after year. Today, a commission that is supposed to come up with a long-term plan got a sneak preview of a bill that's coming. And as politics guy Marshall Zellinger found, some of them were less than impressed. Do you want to again emphasize this is a a draft uh, of, of a bill. Over four months, the 19-member property tax commission has met to keep you from getting shocked by future property tax bills, leading to a draft bill that is yet to be introduced that not all commission members are satisfied with. These ideas were not vetted for unintended consequences, and I think we need to really be a little bit more thoughtful when we're talking about tax policy. This commission is trying to figure out how to let property owners get some of their property's value tax-free or change the math of how property taxes are calculated. But any change would mean local governments like cities, counties, fire districts, libraries, and schools. They would get less. How do we stop having to come back every single year with some band-aid approach that then per says that the state has to use reserves or table reserves to Backfill. We would need to have some type of mechanism uh, for backfill. Otherwise, there would be a reduction for all the school districts. And after today, the commission considered several new ideas to change the bill that still has yet to be introduced. Ideas that would still knock off some of your property's value tax-free and still provide backfill for local districts that would miss out on some property tax dollars and perhaps creating a 6% cap on how much those local districts can increase each year, excluding school districts. So if there's something we can do to be calming for 2024 and build on new ideas for 2025, I highly recommend it. 
Once again, I have proven property tax policy is clear as mud. Those ideas I mentioned at the end, to become real, they'll have to end up in a new draft bill, perhaps over the weekend, that accounts for how the state can also pay for any savings you and I would get. Where would that come from? The state's piggy bank, the state education fund, Tabor money. And I know we say they have less than two weeks, but Kyle, the reality is if they don't figure it out by, I think it's May 8th, there has to be oh. a special session called Special oh. Session. Okay. Wish that we had time to talk about this, but we're trying to stuff 10 pounds of news into a five-pound sack today, so it's time for weather. Same is true in the weather department, trying to stuff a lot of weather in a short amount of time. So bear with me, guys. We have a live look right now at our HD Doppler radar where we're seeing these scattered storms all across the state. But we zoom into the Denver metro area where a special weather statement has just been issued. These areas where we're seeing yellow and even orange, this is where we're going to look for some hail, maybe penny-sized hail, very gusty winds, of course, lots of lightning and thunder. This will be across Denver and through Broomfield into Boulder. We zoom out a bit more and you can still see these very scattered storms across the urban corridor, snow off to the west. And then we take a look at the eastern plains where some of this moisture is starting to push its way into the plains. Right now is just very small, brief, isolated storms. Those will continue to expand as we go through the rest of the weekend. We take a look at the high country. We're still looking at lots of snow in areas like Eagle, Vail, Aspen, Crested Butte. And then take a look further south where we are getting some thunder snow even south of Gunnison, south of Salida, even making its way through Purgatory and through Telluride. Some heavier storms pushing in through Grand Junction. So as we take a look at our winter weather alerts, these go in effect tomorrow morning through Sunday morning. The uh, foothills into the mountains of Summit County, Rocky Mountain National Park, all of these areas are under winter storm warning where the lower elevations are expecting maybe up to a foot of snow. Higher elevations could see one to three feet. We move our way westward in the rest of the high country areas, north to south under winter weather advisories. These areas not expecting quite as much, just around six to 12 inches. We zoom into our snow totals across the foothills and these areas are looking at around up to a foot, some areas even more. We could even get some snow south of Denver across the Palmer Divide. As the snows or as the storms go, we do just have a general risk for thunderstorms today. As we go into the overnight hours and early tomorrow, we're going to see those stronger storms push their way in and kind of linger through tomorrow midday. My good news is we've got a beautiful, warm, wet spring, uh, perfect conditions for tree planting and getting more trees in the ground. It is the good news that is available to every one of us this time of year. Happy Arbor Day to you and the trees in your life, and to one particular fifth grader who just won a statewide competition. Today we're at the Denver Botanic Gardens. We are celebrating the Colorado Tree Coalition's fifth grade Arbor Day poster contest. We have our winner from Castle Rock here to celebrate his first place prize. You're the winner. The purpose of the poster contest is to promote trees and educate students on the importance and value of trees. This year we had over 30 schools from across Colorado participate and we have all 30 uh, posters on display. Oliver, out of the goodness of his heart, actually wanted to donate $100 back from his prize to the CTC, which has never been done before to my knowledge, but pretty noble of this little guy. So if we give him a round of applause. This is Rita. As grandmother to this wonderful grandchild, um, it was very good news to see that what we started back when they were three and four trying to paint and draw has actually become this really amazing artist. Good news today is we feel very blessed because Oliver's uh, father was uh, about a week ago had some um, surgery and to be able to have him here, uh, we're always grateful and blessed for that. My good news is I won a tree poster competition for the state, and I won a bunch of prize money. It makes us feel very proud of him, and I'm very proud that he's just becoming a great artist, and we will never forget Arbor Day ever again. <laughs> Congrats to them. Hey, still calm, still peaceful on the Auraria campus. We'll keep an eye and be back with your feedback next. Gwen writes in about the Elijah McLean case to say law enforcement does not stop or contact anyone that's doing nothing wrong. Stop reporting that he did nothing wrong. Gwen, with all due respect, that is a complete fantasy world that you have created for yourself. I would say, though, that is a fantasy world that I would love to live in and a fantasy world that Elijah would be alive in. See you next time.